Well, well, well. Welcome back, gentlemen and ladies. I do believe, I think there is some ladies. Ladies, give a shout out in some manner, shape, or form in, in the ratings or reviews if you listen to this podcast. I believe so. I believe I got an email from someone the other day from a lady, I think. I don't, but I'm not going to say who because I don't want to, <laughs> to embarrass somebody. It's one of those, well, I'm not going to say. I think it was from a lady, though. And that being said, um, we got some guests coming on pretty soon. This episode is going to be about how I became a helicopter pilot. And it's not about me per se. Like, I'm not making this episode about me. I'm just doing what I did and what it takes to become a helicopter pilot. So I don't know how many people that's really going to entertain or enjoy. But this comes directly from... Oh, did I erase that? I think I erased that email. Why would I do that? I was going to give a shout out to the guy that, oh, here it is, Malachi. So Malachi wrote in an email, <coughs> excuse me, to <coughs> um, actually the MVM show email. So our email, if you have any ideas on stuff you would like to hear or guess whatever, you can email us at the MVM show podcast at gmail.com. And Malachi emailed, and I want to say, uh, Malachi, thank you for this. I've been meaning to do this, an episode on this. And uh, he actually, it sounds like he works for Advanced Helicopter Services, so you know the helicopter side well, and you would like to know more details on that. And thank you for your service. He was a Pavehawk crew chief in the Air Force, and he said he enjoys the crew chief stories too, which I haven't done in a long time. And I don't even like, how much have I really even talked about all that crew chief stuff? Um, Man, I could talk for hours about experiences and things that happen in, in military and all that kind of stuff, but um, that's what, not what this episode is going to be about. This one is going to be about how I became a helicopter pilot. So I guess what I'll do is I'll just start from the beginning, and I want to reiterate this before I really get going, but guys, thank you, thank you so much for those of you that are watching on YouTube. If you haven't subscribed yet, please subscribe. It's growing. It's almost 800 now. Um, Got to hit a thousand before I can really start getting paid from YouTube for that. And I think it's going to be worth it. I just about quit like three or four times on YouTube for the podcast because it takes a lot more work. It's really easy just recording the voice and then uploading it to the server that does for the podcast. But for YouTube, it takes time for it to upload to YouTube, to edit, which it doesn't take a bunch of editing. It just adds more time. More time that makes me not want to do it, you know, like YouTube for the podcast, not podcast. I'm not going to stop the podcast because just recording the voice is so easy. So anyways, please help us hit a thousand subscribers on there and I have plenty of watch time to start getting paid on there. Just need the number to hit that thousand mark. So I'm hoping this duck season will hit it, but we'll see. And again, thank you for all the support with Sarah, my wife coming on. It's like she's like in the top five of the last ten episodes. So I obviously you guys are either really enjoy when she comes on or just the way we communicate. I don't know what it is, but they always do really good. And so I really enjoy having her on. And she's it's my wife, so like we can talk about whatever and just I guess I don't know how to say it. It's just fun because we can kind of get pick at each other and we're both pretty open, honest people. So anyways, let's get started on this episode, how I became a helicopter pilot. So <clears throat> I have always loved helicopters since I was a little kid. I think the first time I realized I wanted to do it, I had to have been eight, nine years old, something like that. And what it was is how it inspired me was being a little kid, my dad watching obviously some type of Vietnam War movie or something like that. And I remember at that age, I want to be a Vietnam helicopter pilot. I literally remember that. Like, I, I was wishing I could have been that era. Not, not obviously, it's such a dangerous time. And we've had guys on here from the Vietnam era. An actual helicopter pilot. So if you haven't heard that and you're newer to the podcast, you can go all the way back. I believe it was in the first five episodes of this podcast. <clears throat> Let me go get it for you real quick. And... uh Ken Carlton, awesome guy, and just a great outlook in life. Such a great positive attitude. Um, it was episode five, Shot Down in Vietnam with Ken Carlton. So if you want to check that out and hear that, it's an amazing episode. But uh, 
<clears throat> Anyways, I feel like I missed my calling and my times. Like, yeah, I I'm still enthralled by it. Like to this day, and having. Um, I think I'm around the 8,400 mark. I have to look, um, uh, look at my logbook, but I'm around 8,400 hours in helicopter and with all different kinds of mixed models. But, um, I've been flying since I was 22. I went, started going to flight school in January, first week of January of, let me do my math here in my brain, 2006. <laughs> And so I didn't do it for a living then, but I'm saying I've been in a helicopter flying it for 16 years. Have uh, 8,400 hours, give or take, somewhere around there. Maybe, ten, you know, <clears throat> I might be off. I'm not going to try to get down to the exact. I can pull the logbook out, but I'm not going to. Anyways, majority of that has been in crop dusting in an OH-58 or what most people call Jet Ranger, which there is a difference between those two. Um, Jet Ranger... Uh, just there's different things about it. I'm not going to get into those details. An OH-58 Alpha model has like the, the, the flat windscreen and most all, all Jet Rangers have the kind of like the round uh, windscreen, windshield, whatever you want to call it. But most of my time is in that. Now I'm building up Hue Huey time pretty quick, which has just been a dream since I was eight years old. And it took me 16 years. Some people it happens. A buddy I fly with right now, it's like, one of his first helicopters. I'm like, you don't know how fortunate you are. And he's like, yeah, I do. But I'm like, no, not really. Because you know it's cool. But in all reality, you don't understand. <clears throat> it's taken me all this time. And I fly locally. Part-time for a sheriff's department. I recently quit the medevac job, which I have about four years total time of doing MetaFlight. I really, really like that. Honestly, I really do. It's probably one of my top jobs. I do like Ag2. The flying's fun, but I don't like the unscheduled you can't control your schedule with ag. It's just ag. It's blue collar work. You got to work when it's time to work, and then you sit around and wait when there's no work. <clears throat> I'm giving you a little background what I'm doing right now, and then we'll go into the process that it took. But for I fly part time for the sheriff's department. Me and one other guy. Um, they have a Huey and they have a Robinson R44. Um, <clears throat> The Hueys, if you don't know, is a turbine helicopter. The R44 is a piston engine helicopter. Super small, too. Uh, it's funny because the main rotor blades on the R44 are this, almost the same size as the tail rotor blades on the Huey. So that just shows the massive size of a Huey versus a little R44. But And now I'm flying a Huey for spraying as well. And I just love it because... In a Jet Ranger, you can only carry about 80 to 100 gallons of material to spray the fields with the crops, whereas the Huey, you can carry 300 gallons. So you're carrying triple. And then um, my swath, you know, with the Jet Ranger is like 44, 46 feet, whereas on the Huey, it's 78, 80 feet. So you're just knocking serious work out. You're not having to land on the truck as much and get filled up because you got so much you're carrying and you do have to do less loads on the field. But anyways, that being said, that's current times. Um, let's, let's talk about the process here. So let me take a swig of coffee here. Like I said, I've been meaning to do this episode for a long time. It just... I didn't want to make it all about me, but I want to make it about the process of you that are listening. <clears throat> so I've wanted to do this for years, but in my mind, and probably a lot of your minds too, maybe not, maybe it was just me, I thought you had to go in the military. And it's not that I didn't want to do the military because I ended up doing it anyways, and I was a crew chief in the Army, Army National Guard, and... I thought you had to be in the military. Well, one day, um, I must say, you know, I was in construction and I was driving somewhere. I was driving north on 99 in a blue F-250 uh, Ford passed me up on the freeway and he had a sticker on the back of his windshield say, become a helicopter pilot. And it said Silver State Helicopters. And I sped up, and I seen that right away. And I was like, what? You know, you don't have to be in the military. I mean, I guess that's just stupid and, and naive. You know, I was like, 
close. I was 21, getting close to 22 at the time. And I sped up. I wrote the number down, and it also said on the back of their their uh, back windshield or back glass said, um, "Take a demo flight now." And I and it didn't give a price. I called that number right then and there. I called them up. I said, "Hey, what's a demo flight cost?" And I, and I highly suggest that. So if you want to be a helicopter pilot and you haven't been in or around helicopters, uh, Malachi, I feel like you 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 are a crew chief, so you already kind of know. But still, to do a demo flight is just a good way to seal the deal, right? Like, yes, this is what I want to do. This is sick. So I scheduled that. I can't remember what it cost me. I want to say it was at like 100 bucks or 150 bucks. And they told me I could take whoever I want as part of the deal. And I was like, sweet. So I took the people that would be with me and supporting me, my fiance, which is now my wife, Sarah. Uh, we were only like a, a, like a month, maybe three weeks away from getting married. And... um and so I invited Sarah and I invited my dad and, uh, we went out there and we jumped in an R44 and I went, I don't remember who the instructor was I was with, but we went to this school that was in Los Banos, California at the time. And we went on the demo flight and it was everything I could imagine. I was like, this is what I want to do. This is what I want to do. I, I'm sick of construction. God bless every blue collar construction guy out there. We, we cannot make it without you guys. And there's no harder workers on this earth than construction guys and i mean construction is such a vast deal right welders framers roofers um plumbers finish workers concrete guys like i mean i could just go on and on i'm not going to try to leave anybody out if i i will obviously if i keep going but that's what i grew up doing my dad owned a roof trust company and from the time i was six seven years old i was out that treasure with him every summer all the time and and my dad instilled in me to be a hard worker. And me and Harrison are going to do a podcast on uh, working hard, work ethic, and blue-collar people here soon. But anyways, we're talking about how to become a helicopter pilot, how I became one. So anyways, <clears throat> I went on that demo flight. It was everything I could imagine. We picked it up. Obviously, you can't hover. And we did. he got us going. He said, all right, you take the controls. And I took the controls, and I'm just going straight and level. And I'm like, oh, this is amazing. And I was feeling the sensitivity of the helicopter. And like, man, it just... It's touchy, and and we landed. I'm like, where do I sign? I'm coming to this school, and um, they end up having a big seminar, and I end up signing up, that, I think like a week or two later, and I end up signing up, signing the dotted line, and I didn't need a co-sign or nothing, and it was, I don't know. I can't explain to you how that worked at that time with the student loan and all that stuff, but... It was way easier than it is now. And it was like $70,000 because I was going to do the whole package. It was like sixty nine nine, And it was get your private, get your instrument rating to basically fly in, you know, the clouds, to put it in layman's terms. Um, get your commercial rating, which is how you get paid. For private, you can only do that for your own enjoyment. You can't get paid for by doing that. And then get my certified flight instructor. And... Um, I signed up for all those. Well, I started, and I'm doing this part time, right? So I'm doing my job, and this is this is what I'm kind of listening to what I'm saying. I'm I'm not tr I'm trying not to get on rabbit trails because if you can dissect what I'm saying and realize like, oh, that's what I can do or what I can't do. But I want to tell you right now, I was working full time in construction and trying to go in the evenings and learn how to be a helicopter pilot. Well, we started with ground classes, and that went on for. A month or two every week and it was like we're all chomping a bit i think there was like 30 in our class and we're like man when are we gonna start flying right you know that's what you always think but you gotta have the foundation you gotta have the basics <clears throat> dynamics of flight all these different things and so finally they started this in the sim and they said we need to get you five to ten hours depending on how you do in the simulator before we're gonna step in an r22 and so you jump in the sim, and it's pretty close um, on the real deal, but it's just this is never going to be the same. So it moves with you. You can feel the oscillation of the sim. And it was like, whoa, my best definition of a how to hover an aircraft, and I'm not talking about a Pavehawk, a Blackhawk, all these aircraft that have all these extra... Um, 
parts that are helping you do it. Um, I've had enough buddies tell me that doing a Chinook, a Blackhawk, all that stuff is you basically can take your feet off the pedals, off the cyclic, and pull up on the collective, and it will come up into a perfect tougher. That ain't happening. I'm telling you, in an R22 or aircraft that you learn how to fly in for the first time, that's not what they train you in, okay? Or, or Jet Ranger, any of that. Now, a lot of um, military guys, their first aircraft is Jet Rangers or OH-58s, whatever. They call them T-66s or something in the military. It's the same thing. But anyways, um, it. but hovering in aircraft, a helicopter, is like, this is how I'm going to give you. you. If you ever go do it and become a helicopter pilot, you're going to think of these words I tell you right now. It is like hov- It is like balancing a BB on a bowling ball. Try to do that and tell me how possible that is. Put a BB on there and balance that thing. It can go any direction. That BB can literally fall off any way, right? Well, that's like trying to hover. It can oscillate any direction, forward, back, left, 45, at an 80, at a 60 degree, like backwards, up, down. So the first time you take the controls, it's wild. There's not one person on the face of this earth that can ever jump in a helicopter and hover for the first time without killing themselves. Go look on YouTube. Guys that are rich and think, it's, well, it's my aircraft, I'll do whatever I want. They end up crashing the helicopter every single time. I think, if I remember right, I hovered at about, okay, we did the sim, then we jumped in the real thing. And I want to say I hovered around five or six hours. It was somewhere, I mean, maybe it might have been four, but that's pretty low, honestly. It, I did pick it up fast, but I will tell you this. My armpits were wet. <laughs> my underwear were wet. Because you're stressed, right? It's not a stressful thing. Hovering a helicopter, I can do it with my, almost with my eyes closed and barely have my hand on the control. <clears throat> but it's all about experience, right? I was soaking wet, sweating. It's going left, right, up, down. And, and basically the instructor will let it almost semi get out of control just for you to feel like. And then they'll grab it and boom, it's frozen right back into place again. It's right where, I mean, and you're looking at them, and they're use, they're no effort. They're not death gripping it. They're not freaking out, and you're just like, oh, my goodness. How are they doing that? You know, and they're like, just, if you think it, the helicopter will do it. And that's so true. You literally just think it. If you think forward, your body, without knowing it, your hand's almost doing that motion just by thinking it. And that's how you move a helicopter, really. you If you do it. It's such small inputs. If you're watching on, on the YouTube channel, like when I'm hovering, you will not see. I'm holding the cyclic, which is the one that goes between your legs. The collective is, is your, you hold with your left hand. It doesn't matter if you're left or right hand. That's just how it's got to be. So the collective is with your left hand, which makes you go up and down. It's your power, right? The cyclic is in between your legs. It's left, right, forward. I, I mean, every direction, right? <clears throat> and then your pedals are your spinning motion basically left and right like so if you freeze in place and you hit your left pedal you'll just right in place you'll turn it all the way completely around in a 360 and by same thing with the right pedal right but both hands both feet are doing work and um uh you know it's just it, it gets out of control you're trying to learn how to do it finally you realize it's small inputs but anyways what i was going to say is is hovering you will not see my hand moving when I'm hovering, if you jumped in with me and you watched my hand and I was in a hover, you want to, there could, I'm making little inputs, but more likely you're not going to see it in my hand. So, um, I finally got that down. And then what they started working on is, um, and this is just getting used to helicopter. Okay. Straight level. Everyone can pretty much do that right away, right out the gate, no matter who you are, but hovering different ball game. That's the hardest part. Well, then once you learn how to hover, it's like, okay, now we're going to add in pedal turns. So they would be like, we'd be on a box and you'd go, you would follow that box in the dead center of the helicopter and follow that box straight, keeping it the same height, not coming up and down, not spinning, not sideways. And then you get to the end of that line and you turn, nose turn it left with your pedal and follow that straight and stay super controlled. We would just do that. We just practice that for like an hour straight for multiple flights, right? Then we'd go take off, and you would learn how to take off, and you would learn about translational lift and um, all these different things, what it all involves, the dynamics of flight and all that stuff. And you would take off, do a pattern, 
at an airport, make an approach, shoot an approach, and land. And looking back, thinking about it, it all seems like yesterday, but it's like funny to think of the mindset now versus then, right? I don't think about landing. I don't think about all the process and the steps and lower this and do this and turn, you know, it's, it's when you become in tune with the helicopter and you pass that stage, it is like you are the helicopter. When I fly, I'm, I'm the helicopter. I feel like a bird. I, it's me. It's not like I'm in this aircraft and I got to make it do these things. It is me. And that's what you want to become, right? And it will. When you build enough hours, and it takes time, though. That takes several hundred hours, you know. I mean, obviously, you're good, you know, at 150 hours, 200 hours or whatever. But in, in the end, it's not the same, right? Well, then you make these approaches and you're thinking about it. I remember making these approaches just like, oh, and I'm not getting down fast enough. And I remember the instructor like, you are in control. You make this aircraft do what it does. No one else. He goes, it's not going to just do it by itself. It's not going to land itself. You make it land. If you want it to slow down and come down quick, because I remember just being very finessey and very light on the controls. But man, you can yank and bank a helicopter. ain't going to hurt it. But, you know, I'm just trying to do the right thing in your tents, right? White knuckling it and just uh, death grip and everything. And um, um, so, you know, you get that down and then you're studying and you're reading the FAR aim. So you want to get a FAR aim, it's, which is a Federal Aviation Regulation slash Aeronautical something. Oh, what is it? My goodness. And I, obviously, I should know this, right? But get time under your belt. I guess you become uh, sloppy with things. It's not very often you look in it. Far aim. It's AIM. Aeronautical Information Manual. So it's a book, and each year it has a new one <clears throat> because it's from the FAA, which is the Federal Aviation Administration. That's who licenses you. It's kind of like the DMV. And every year it has a new one, so you got to have the current one. So you'll study that and... You learn about all the regs, and so when you look at it, though, it's like usually a blue background with red labeling, and it says FAR slash AIM, and you'll get that. You'll study that. You'll buy books. Um, they'll tell you what to buy, whatever flight school that you go to, and again, it's not cheap, but let me just tell you, if you're looking to in, at doing that as a career, you do not need to get your instructor. You do not well, I would suggest getting your um, instrument. And honestly, if you're doing it through the military and they're paying for it, get as much as you can because it's only it's like a resume. The more certs you get, the better off you're going to be and the more hireable you are. So, I, hey, anybody wants to pursue this, I'm more than happy to try to help. And if you want more questions, you can email me and that's something else I can talk about because honestly, sometimes there's so much to it. It's too hard just to reply by email and write this book. I'm, to me, I prefer just getting on here and telling you how to do it because I know it interests people that probably don't even want to become helicopter pilots. It's probably just interesting. <clears throat> but um, yeah, the you have any questions, email me and I'll answer those in another episode or something. But um, unless it's just a quick, easy answer. So it's a ton of money, but to get a job, you really just need a commercial. If you want to get a job and get paid for it, you got to get your private first. That's just how it is. And then you get your commercial rating. And once you get that, you can be paid for your services. And there's lots of things you can do. You can um, work on a tuna boat. Um, an instructor is a great way. Most people start out as being an instructor, and it's a good way for you. Teaching people makes you a better pilot. I end up never doing that. Uh, I didn't really want to do it, but I was going to do it. But I ended up getting into agra out the gate. I paid some hard dues and became a loader for an ag company while I would ferry the helicopter around. And that was like a couple years before I even was allowed to spray my first field. So <clears throat> just know that if you're not going to be an instructor, maybe you want to look into doing ag. Maybe you're in part of the country where there's a lot of ag going on and it's helicopter. Even if airplanes, same thing. Um, airplanes way cheaper. I will tell you that. Way cheaper. And if you want, you can go airplane into helicopter, which actually saves you money because you can go get your airplane private license and then transition over to helicopter and get your helicopter. And it is a lot cheaper doing that. But you can start out straight as a helicopter pilot. Let me look up something. I did see something on Instagram. That was a school. 
Not saying they're cheap, though. That's the problem because it's still going to be expensive. But they're like, oh, you don't have to. You don't have to uh, <clears throat> go be an airplane pilot first, then be in a helicopter. You can come straight to the school. It's like, well, yeah, but it's going to cost you more unless they have a, a cheaper rate. Most people will not give you the rate on their website. Usually you got to call. And I shouldn't say most. Most of them probably do. Um, I don't remember if this school did give that. But anyways, I was going to try to find, give you the Instagram deal for that school. Let me see if I can find it real quick because I think it was worthwhile to send that to shout that out because I didn't see their prices, <clears throat> but they looked like they had a lot of aircraft, which is what you would want. You want a school that's plenty of aircraft because you do not want to be fighting for time. If there's a lot of students or a new class and they they're like, Oh, we only have one aircraft. <sighs> Good luck. I mean part of I guess part of what I want to say in all this is to be okay doing it part-time is hard it's not impossible guys do it but i'm just telling you right now all those guys that i watched do it took them a long time <clears throat> and that's the problem most of us are working men we have families right if you're a single guy find a way that you can man this bug is mosquito and he's dead now find a way um you can go full time. And I know that that is like almost not feasible for most people. But if you can take a loan out to live off of, you can knock it. I knocked all of those out in six months and I ended up going full time because what happened was I was about to quit. And I, man, I didn't want to. I was I, I did not want to. Well, someone noticed that I wasn't going anymore in training. A friend of a friend of mine's dad. And he's like, you know what? Me and this, you know, this was time during construction was doing really good. And I, I still owe those guys big time. Steve Taylor and Ben Pinfield, those were two guys that came to me and said, we want to help you out. We want to see you do this. We want to say, make this dream come true. And I, I cannot owe those guys enough. I still actually call those guys. I used to do it like every year and I haven't done it in a while. But for years, I've called them and just said, hey, thank you. You know, thank you for helping me out. You, I wouldn't, I don't know what I would have did without you guys. That's what's fed my family for years now. And it's brought so much joy into a career that I look forward to going to work. I don't hate going to work, you know, that's the dream, right? And, um, they said, Hey, we don't want you to quit. We know you're working as hard as you can. Plus you're going there afterwards. Why don't you tell us what it bare minimum it costs? And I still was working a little bit to try and best I could. I didn't want to take money from them, but they're like bare minimum what it will cost you to live and pay your bills. And at this time, I only had one child, and she was a little, little baby, so expenses were way less than they are now. But we'll pay you that. Go full time. And I'm like, okay. So they put the pressure on me. I didn't want to do it, and they kept like, you know, you need to do it. So I ended up doing it, <clears throat> and I don't like borrowing money from people or doing stuff like that. But um, I said, okay, I'm going to do it. Well, <laughs> them putting that pressure on me and knowing that, the, yeah, I'm going to pay them back and all this stuff, but it was like, I'm go. I'm gonna work my guts out till I about kill myself because I got to get this done even sooner than is even possible. So, I started going seven days a week. Actually, I don't think I could go seven. I think they were closed on Sundays, if I remember right. I was there six days a week, six days a week, every week, and I knocked it out in like five and a half months. I got my private because I just wasn't able to get it done, study enough, working as much as I was. I got my private quick, like boom. I got my instrument, boom, right after that. I got my commercial, and then I got my CFI. And I did that in like five and a half months, all those ratings. And you can do it too. Anybody can do it if that's the way they can do it, you know, or if it's a young guy, if you're 18, 19, whatever, 17, 18, 19, or whatever, and you're young, living at home, man, that's the best time to do it. It's a big, fat bill, but I'm telling you what, if that's what you want to do, that's the time to do it because you can go and don't jack around. Don't stretch it out. I'm just telling you right now because it, help, flying a helicopter is such a fill thing. You, if you don't, if you only fly once a week when you're that new, I promise you, you're not gonna. It's you're hardly not gonna get better, honestly. And I was, uh, and I'm not just saying this, but like I felt like I was made to fly helicopters. Like I felt it was, I was kind of a natural at it. I'm kind of a, I was a natural at the very beginning, 
there was guys that had 30 hours and still couldn't hover in a helicopter. And they were older, though, okay? I was only 21. At, or I was 22 at the time. But most everybody did it around the same time, about 7 to 10 hours. They started hovering, and that's the big thing. Once you get to hover down, you're, you're good to go. But if you can't hover, you will have problems. And there was guys that left because they couldn't hover. They just literally couldn't do it. But I would say out of 30 guys, only one or two were like that. So I am I feel in my mind, anybody can do it, okay? But you have to go as much as possible, at least three times a week. Airplane's totally different. I promise you, I, I've flown an airplane. I've got like 100 plus hours in an airplane. I bought an airplane um, when I was doing that back three, four years ago or whatever. And... After you fly a helicopter, and I was, I mean, obviously I've been flying a helicopter for years. Flying an airplane was like, this is it, this is it. <laughs> you know, like, wow, this is so easy. I mean, I soloed in two hours, two and a half hours. I think I soloed at 19.6 hours in a helicopter before I soloed. It was like 19.6. And obviously that was my first aircraft I had ever flown. Now, fast forward and you got a pilot that has like seven thousand seven thousand hours at the time a helicopter pilot jumps an airplane yes of course that's way easier trust me an airplane's way easier to fly than a helicopter and that's not a bash on anybody it just ask an airplane guy that he'll he'll admit the same thing but um <clears throat> again like i said anybody can do it you know it just takes the time to learn but um um what was i saying Oh, and, and I and I solo I soloed the airplane. I don't even think it was two hours, honestly. I think it was like we did we did a flight. We came back the next day. He was showing me how to land. We came back the next day. We did two more approaches and landings and takeoffs. And he's like, All right, I'm getting out. I'm like, uh, excuse me, wait, hold on. What? <laughs> hold on. Like I felt like I could do it, but I was like, dude, I'm like barely barely started doing it by myself like literally two or three landings and takeoffs by myself completely he's like you're good dude he got out and i was like okay i i think i was a little more nervous on that than i even was um <clears throat> uh hovering or, or flying the soloing for the first time and it's cool a tradition is when you solo for your first time so you just a little heads up if you think you're gonna solo that day and your instructor says you're probably gonna solo tomorrow Wear a shirt that you don't mind getting cut up because they're going to cut the back of your shirt out and say first solo. And I wish I had that. Thinking now this reminds me. That was up hanging up in the school and that school shut down. Fed shut it down. They were doing some shady stuff in the company or something, I guess. But luckily I got all my licenses before that happened. But my shirt was framed and in that. Doggone it. I wonder who has that. I wish I could get that back. There's got to be a way to get that somehow. Anyways... Uh, they cut your shirt out. They put your name. You sign it. The instructor puts his name on it, and then they put the solo date. And it's pretty cool. So just forewarning: wear a shirt you don't mind getting cut off. And at that point, when you solo for the first time, you're like, I almost don't even care. It's it's cool. So um, it's a little pilot tradition. That's airplane or helicopter. Um. So anyways, so I got all my licenses. There's a ton of book work. I, I excelled in the flying part of it, but the book work was really hard for me. I'm just not a natural um, knowledge guy. I don't retain stuff good. I feel like it has to be pounded in my head a thousand times before I retain it. But physically doing it, it was like all for me. Like I was so confident in it, you know, in my ability to fly. And it was always the – so what happens is – when your your instructor tells you finally, they're putting endorsements in your logbook, like, okay, you can solo cross country, you're going in, you you get your first solo under your belt, then you keep getting instruction from your, your, your um, instructor on how to do auto rotations, which is if you lose an engine, that's how you would land it, right? And trust me, people say, oh, that's scary. You just die if you lose your engine in a helicopter. That's absolutely not true. You are, to me, I I feel safer losing an engine in a helicopter than I would in an airplane because you you can glide farther in an airplane because of the size of the wings on an airplane, but you need a long open area to land it because you need so much runway or space to run on. Whereas a helicopter, when you lose an engine, it's called an auto rotation and the sprag clutch, or there's other ways it can be described, it separates from the main rotor. That's what spin the rotor, the motor spins the rotor. <laughs> keeps that spinning, but when you do an auto rotation, it separates and 
you drop, you can kind of like drop hard, right? You're kind of free falling somewhat. You're gliding still. Your ratio is not the same as an airplane. But the upward movement of the air through the rotor system keeps the blades spinning, and you have a full control in the collective to get less power or more power. But you, when that happens and you lose your, let's say if you lose your engine, you practice those all the time, by the way. In training, it becomes second nature, but the wind movement through the rotor system is what keeps those blades spinning. And then you just use that power and you come down and you only need a little area. You flare out and boom, set it right on the ground and pull power at the lap. You know, pull power. I say pull power, but you're really pulling pitch because the motor's off, right? Or the engine's off. And there you go. You don't, you can land a helicopter up flying if you lose your motor, no problem. Is it is that stressful? Well, yeah, it would be if you lose your motor, but you it's totally doable and you practice it all the time. So, anyways, um, man, there's so much to this. I don't see how in the world I could do this in an one episode that's not annoyingly long. This has already been 35 minutes or six, whatever. Hopefully, it's not boring, you guys. But I'm sure the people that want to know <clears throat> enjoy it. But um. Let's see. So how to become a helicopter pilot. So that's what you do. You do the book work. You do the check rides. That is stressful. I will tell you that I actually failed my first private check ride. And what happens is your instructor signs you off to say, okay, you are proficient and ready to take this check ride. He fills that out. <clears throat> and um, a DPE shows up. You schedule it. It's I want to say it's like five, six hundred bucks. I don't know. Now it might be seven hundred fifty bucks, a thousand bucks to schedule a check ride. So you want to know your stuff because you lose that money if you don't pass the check ride and you got to pay it again. But <clears throat> the instructor helps you schedule a DPE, a designated pilot examiner. So he comes in and he does the what we call the oral the oral check ride. So he goes through like to you like what do you know about this? And there's a handbook. That you'll be by the school give you or tell you to buy. Like, this is what you got to know. These are the parts of the far aim that you got to know to be a licensed helicopter private pilot. <clears throat> and so you just study the dog out of those, right? And, of course, they're still going to throw you stuff you don't know just to mess with you. But you sit down and do their oral, oral examination. And they test your knowledge. And if you get through that, because they might fail you right there and say, you know what? You just don't know where I'm going to go fly. There's no point. But if you get through that and you pass that which is super stressful. It can last around an hour or so. Then you go get in the helicopter. He watches you do the walk around. He watches you do your pre-flight. Then you get in, you start it up, and you go do these certain things, right? And you've got these parameters to do these things. He wants to see a nice, stable hover that you're not having variances outside this certain specifications, you know, like give or take 10 feet or whatever it is. I can't remember. Then he wants to see you do pedal turn, the simple stuff. Private's the easiest one, right? They do pedal turns, then do a normal takeoff, then do a, a normal approach to a spot, you know, give or take so many feet, 50 feet or whatever it is. Then do a steep approach, then do a, I think, I think they want you to do a high performance takeoff, so like straight up and then forward movement. Um, you have to do a hovering auto, and then you got to do an auto rotation, a full auto rotation. And that's, you know, you got so many feet, give or take, to where they give you leeway. But when you get your commercial, those parameters squeeze way in because now you're going to be getting paid for it. So you should be even better, right? And that's why they do that. Instrument was fun, but actually I failed my instrument too. So I, I failed my private the first time. I got this, I got it the second check ride. Then I did, I want to say I did my instrument first. I'm pretty sure I did. Did my instrument. I felt that because I did my missed approach and I turned the wrong way. He goes, you had it aced and you did your missed, your missed approach. Turned, I turned right when I should have turned left or something stupid. I was so mad. But he actually let me do, redo it like an hour later. We just did it right then. He didn't recharge me. <clears throat> and I passed it. That was, oh, that made me so mad. <laughs> I aced that thing. Then I went for my commercial and I passed out the first time, and I did my CFI, my certified flight instructor, and I passed out the first time. That, I will tell you, the CFI was the most horrible thing I've ever done in my life. Stressful out the wazoo. There's nothing that was more stressful than that. I want to say the oral portion of it was like four or five hours minimum, for sure. 
for sure four. I think it was like closer to five. And you're teaching a guy that's been has thousands of hours how to fly a helicopter. Imagine that, right? Because he's just examining you and you're trying to act like he's an idiot and don't know anything. And you, I've got this whole binder full of how to teach him on flight and why the blades do this and how takeoff works and how a helicopter works. And, and like I said, the, being the guy that I am that's not good with that stuff, um, it was horrible. <clears throat> but I aced, I passed it the first time and then we did the check ride and then I'm teaching him how to fly and like, this is how you do this and this is why you do this and you're supposed to be just money, right? Well, <clears throat> how I did that is I was just teaching my wife, teaching my friends, teaching my dad, teaching my brother, like pretend they, well, they don't know how to fly, right? So I was teaching all them and that's how I became proficient. But it was a stressful deal. But yeah, and... I don't know if that was enough detail. I'm just telling you, those are the things that you practice. I think I covered most of the little stuff because really little details. I can't remember a lot, um, but when you do get your first license, they give you a temporary card. The DPE signs it. You go on the FAA site, fill out your information, and then like so many weeks, you get your official pilot's license in a card form, you know, a hard card form like your driver's license. And then it says that such and such Titus Headings is certified as a private pilot to fly the Then you get your instrument add-on, and that's a different. They resend you another license. Then you get your commercial, and I think they send you a new one, and that's the one you hold the commercial with with uh, an instrument rating, and that's on that card. And um, you carry that around and got to fly with it, right? And then I got my certified flight instructor. But that your certified your commercial is forever, right? All you gotta do, you'll never lose that. You can never lose it unless you do drugs or get caught something like that, and they can take it from you. But um, oh, what was I gonna say? I got I lost my train of thought. Um. Oh, but when you get your certified flight instructor. That can leave you. So you got to stay up on your like continuing education hours and you got to do this thing every so often, right? And I let my lapse. I never used it. I used it like once or twice. I didn't never work at a school as a flight instructor, but I was flying a, a couple friends around giving them instruction. And if I can log the time and they can log the time if I have a safe fight. But if we're both commercial, only one pilot can log at a time. Unless you're doing like second in command like SIC. And but the PIC, which is the pilot commands, what who's who logs the time. So SIC is not the same as PIC. Trust me, you need PIC. Sometimes you got to start out with SIC to get a certain job, and that's fine. It counts for something, but for the most part, it's not really ours. If that makes sense. Um, so I got those ratings, got them all done. I did that like about five and a half months. Like I said, then I was like, okay, now I got to find a job, right? And that company at that time was all over the United States. And so I was like, I'm just going to fly for them. It's an easy transition. Well, there was this, I believe there was this this opening in Oklahoma. There was nothing locally. I'm like, hey, whatever I got to do and take my family to pay my dues and get a job, a dream job and work close to home. That's what I got to do. So I was basically going to take this position in Oklahoma. And right when I did the school, the feds came in and shut that school down. Silver State, Silver State helicopters. Look them up on Google. You'll still find see all that goofy stuff. So the the CEO, the main guy, was ripping people off, stuff with tax evasion too. I think stuff like that. So luckily, I was done. It was this was like two months after I left the school, or a month after. So then I end up not going and doing that job as an instructor. But then I was driving down the road, and this ag guy in a helicopter come buzzing over, out, made me go off the road because he was so low. I was like, dude, that looks sick. I didn't know they did that in a helicopter. I thought they just did that in airplanes. So I went by, followed him back to his shop. And he's a local crop dusting guy around here. And I followed him back to his shop. And um, I was like, do you need a pilot? <laughs> and he was like, no, sorry. You know, blah, blah, blah. And I went, I went there five times. I'm trying to get a job, right? Now I'm back doing construction again. I got all my ratings, but I'm, I'm like having to pay my bills. And I'm like, I got to get a job. And I'm looking around, applying. And I went back to fifth time and he's like, you know what? The guy that we were training just quit. He couldn't land on the truck. Um, we can start you out as a loader. You can drive the truck and load me as the helicopter pilot, the owner operator. 
and I'll let you ferry once in a while and build to- hours and time. And at that time, I was going to be working out of a Bell 47, which is like an old MASH helicopter. I was like, whatever it takes. I don't care. I'll do whatever. And I wasn't making jack. <laughs> like, that. I mean, I guess that was 16 years ago. But, like, I was making half per hour working like a dog what they're paying people to work at McDonald's right now, minimum wage. You know, it's like, my goodness. And um, I paid my dues, man. I can tell you that. Actually, I had to pick up a second job. So I was working, you know, crazy hours, but eh, whatever, eight hours, normal hours, and then up to 16 hours a day loading because it's maybe sometimes longer than that, 18 hours, whatever. And then I would go and do pizza at night, pizza delivery. So, yeah, I was thinking, man, I just finished helicopter flight school, but now I'm doing deli- pizza delivery. But also, I didn't care. I was like, I, and that's the problem with the generation now is there's too much pride there. You, if you got a stinking clean toilets to pay your bills and take care of your family, then, but you turn, you pass that up because that's too low of a job for you. Then you're not a good, you're not a man in my opinion, because if that's what, what I'm saying is if that's the only job you can do, but you put that aside because it's, it's below your whatever then you got a serious problem, and you need to get rid of your pride. Yeah, it wasn't what I wanted to do, but it's what I had to do. It's what I found to do. It was something I can do at night. It was something I can make cash tips and give me a little hourly deal. And so that's what I was doing, and I did that job and ag plus delivering pizzas for Domino's at night. And... um. Like a zombie, I think I worked, the one time I worked 94 days straight like that. And, you know, that was 100, 120 hours a week for 90, you know, 90 days. Not that I have done haven't done that a bunch of other times too, but <clears throat> um, that's what it took, man. The price, some of the prices to be paid, right? Not barely making it. And um, uh, let's see. So I set, kept building up time. That was that way for a couple years. Finally, he's like, okay, you're ready for your first field to spray. And man, that felt amazing. It was stressful and it was cool. And at that time, I had obviously built up another 100, 200 hours flying. And I was getting way, really comfortable with the Bell 47. And a Bell 47 has no governor. So you can't just set the thing at 100% and then let it go and not mess with the throttle. You have to, you're constantly, constantly manipulating the throttle as you fly, which made me a better pilot, really. And then ag just makes you a better pilot, period, because you're not just going, str- picking up, going to one airport to the next landing. That that really doesn't make you a better pilot, honestly. I, I, I mean, I'm not being brutal. I'm just being truthful. But doing ag or doing these jobs that cr- cause a lot of critiquing and a lot of movement are really what helps you be skilled. And it's not an easy price to pay. It's easier to just go straight into being an instructor. And that's good doing that, too, because if you're teaching someone else, it's sketchy, trust me, doing that, but it makes you a better pilot too. So there's there's different things, but um, being an ag pilot is you're right on the deck, you know, two, three, four, five feet off the deck, going across the field, then doing a uh, hard up and going into a hammerhead ag turn. You know, it's just just super sharp turn, diving back down in the field over the wires, going across the field low up again then you're going to land it on a little tiny truck a little platform that looks impossible when you first start like how in the world you know at flight school i had a whole runway to land on wherever i wanted here it's like this little truck and i gotta put it on there and anyways it becomes second nature after you do it thousands of times right i can tell you right now i don't know how many thousands and thousands and thousands of thousands of landings i've made because in one day in ag, you could be making anywhere from 50 to 300 landings on a little truck platform. And you're doing that. And I've done that for 16 years. So, But if you get a guy, a pilot, that just picks up, lifts up, goes to the point, point A, back to point B, how do you get in that? How do you get in that skill set? Not saying those guys can't land good and all that stuff, but it's just if I'm making 200 landings a day, on a little platform and another guy's only making four to six, you just can't, it's just, it's, it has nothing to do about that pilot's better than the other one. It's just the pilot, other pilot becomes better because he's so more efficient and quicker at it because he does it hundreds of times a day. 
So I'm kind of getting out of how to become a helicopter pilot. Um, I, hopefully that I covered that good enough. I don't want to go into, I'm going in more into the weeds of um, the career and the things I do. I can do one on that too, I guess, if someone wanted it. But really, I appreciate if you guys would give me a rating review on uh, Apple Podcast or Spotify. Um, you guys have been doing that, and I appreciate that so much. And your feedback on the YouTube channel as well. Really love that and engaging in that. Um, I don't want to leave anything out. I'm trying to think. I mean, just look them up. Google flight schools. See if there's one close to you. That's by far the best way to do it. Hopefully, you don't have to drive. A lot of times, you probably will have to. Do a lot of research before you just pick one because not only could you save some money, but you want to meet the instructors too because an instructor will make or break you. Um, the instructor I had at first, and I don't care to say this publicly, I, I couldn't honestly, outside of the helicopter, the guy was cool and we were fine. I couldn't stand him inside the helicopter. I did not like the guy. I wanted to knock him out, honestly, because he was so stinking arrogant and cocky. He wasn't a good teacher, and he had problems with multiple, multiple students. He was super arrogant. He would literally... If I turned too early in a like in a pattern at an airport, he would slap the cyclic and make the whole helicopter like shit rock. I'm like, dude, you're an idiot, dude. That's so unsafe and cool. And I told the flight school, I said, I'm leaving the school if you don't get me another, another instructor. Because I mainly had him because we were both, um, well, at the time I was super light. I was like 155. This guy was heavy. And they didn't want to put me with a light instructor because they needed to put the heavier instructors. They have your students with the lighter instructors. So I ended, I ended up switching to a guy that I requested. I said, I'm either leaving and you're losing my business or you're going to give me Al Griffin, one of uh, the instructors there. And they said, no, we'll, we'll make it happen. And, I, and I, I didn't care at that point. That guy was a jerk. And I knew he was going to be all hurt feelings that I didn't want to with him no more. But we didn't mesh in the helicopter and I wasn't learning nothing. He, he was my instructor when I failed the check ride, and it was because he didn't have me. He was mad at me, actually, because it kind of goes a, a check mark against the instructor if they say you're ready, but you're really not. But um, um, he's the one that didn't have me prepared, but the other guy got me ready, and I passed it with flying colors. So anyways, um, so really research and talk. say if you go to a school – and you're just talking to like an admin person, say, I wanna I wanna meet the flight instructor that I would have if I come here and talk to him, see the vibe you get from him. And it and if you're in the military and you can use your um the benefits, the VA benefits and all that stuff to do that, um, you gotta get an accredited school, right? And there's not a lot of them out there, you know, in even in California. Probably Southern California has a lot, but in this the valley the Central Valley of California, there's not a lot. I think there's like one. Really check into that. See how much they're going to help you with it. And, you know, oh, excuse me. how much they're going to pay and how much they'll cover and all that stuff. So really do your research before you get started. And some schools will try to rip you off. So just be careful. I don't, I'm sorry, I don't have any suggestions on which school is the best. You just got to do your homework and you got to think about it, sleep on it, and just Try to pick the right one. That's all I can tell you. Don't rush into it. Um, man, I wish there was more things I could give you. That's probably the biggest thing, right? A lot of times the schools will add in the cost of all the books that you need. Um, if they don't, then you just, just get the books. You can Google that, like books the helicopter pilot needs, order those, which they should. That The school needs to take care of that. If they're not going to give you that as part of the deal, then that's the wrong school to go to. Um, uh, buy yourself a logbook, which is cool, right? Writing your hours down. Um, oh, a headset. You're going to need a headset, and a lot of times the school will provide that too, but um, uh, David Clark's is a good brand to go with. Um, now, if you have the money and you're going to be committed, I highly suggest the Bose A20s, I believe they are. They have noise canceling. You don't realize how amazing it is being in a helicopter with noise canceling headsets until you don't have them. Or if you start without them and then you get one, you're like, I'm never going back. So, yes, they are a grand versus like $300 or $400, whatever the David Clarks are. 
But man, in life, if you're going to go into a career like that and you're going to be already spending the money that you're spending, just get those headsets. You will thank me. Huh. I have a pair of them. I don't even have David Clark's anymore. And and, there, and there's other ones. There's ones called Lightspeed. And they do noise canceling, but there's nothing like Bose. We all know and are going to admit Bose is the top of the line, high quality. So they make airplane headsets and helicopter headsets. And if you bought airplane headsets with the two prongs, you can get a helicopter adapter where you have the two go into the one. So there's a lot of videos on YouTube you can watch. Go get a demo flight is what I would suggest first. Just go get a demo flight. Make sure it is something you want to do. You may feel uncomfortable. You may be afraid of heights, think you didn't know you were, but then you do and you're like, okay, I can't do this. You don't want to commit to something and then try to have to back out of it. They're kind of stringent and tough on that stuff. Ooh, excuse me. Can't, can't stop yawning. Um, I don't think there's nothing else. Stuff's kind of popping in my head, but yeah, just stay on top of it. Go as much as possible. Don't let that deter you. If you can't go three times a week, but I highly suggest if you can go three to six times a week, that's what you need to do. Knock it out. Find a school that has aircraft available. Slots aren't full up. Go to the school and say, hey, how often can I fly? Can I fly every day if I want to? Or are you so, your schedule's so packed I can only get in once a week? Because that ain't going to cut it. I'm just telling you right now, it's not going to cut it. So, yeah, I think I covered everything that needs to be covered. You know, get the loan. You're going to have to figure that out. I can't give you no advice on that, getting the loan for the school. Unless the school does it and provides something like that. Um, you, most of the time you're going to be, you could be in a, a Schweitzer. Those are good. Those would be great aircraft to fly instead of the Huey. I'd, uh, the R-22, I'd rather fly that than a R Robinson R-22, but... R22 is where it's at. That's what I did it in. So, anyways, hopefully that answers all your guys' questions. And um, if I missed anything and it's a quick answer, I'll reply to you in email. The MVM Show Podcast at gmail.com. If, if it's going to be a really wide deal, I'll just do it in another episode or something like that. But, anyways, yeah, hopefully that helps. And uh, been wanting to do it anyway. So, hope you guys enjoyed. See you on the next one.